This story is about a man that impacted Brooklyn, New York in such a way that when he stood in front of the judge, he received seven life sentences, plus an extra 450 years in prison. The judge told him, no country deserves the risk of his ever being on the streets. This is the story of Delroy Edwards. After 300 years of British government, in 1962, Jamaica gained its independence from the United Kingdom. Twenty years later, the two opposing political parties, the People National Party and the Jamaica Labour Party, would go to war for power and control of the island. Word on the street is that Delroy would go to work for the Jamaica Labour Party, which was headed by Edward Siaga. This wasn't the kind of election that you would see in the United States. This election would be won by force and intimidation. It turned into a street war that involved guerrilla warfare tactics, and by the time Edward Siaga had won, more than 700 Jamaicans would have lost their lives in this fight for power. It was said that Delroy had some involvement in a guerrilla squad of killers during this time. After the election, many of the men that committed some of these crimes fled Jamaica and went to Europe and the United States. With the help of a tourist visa, Sometime around 1981, Delroy was one of those men, and he landed in Brooklyn, New York. For a while, marijuana was the hustle. Delroy would sell nickel and dime bags out of a storefront, but something new was on the horizon, and that something was crap. He would set up shop in Brooklyn, and over time became the leader of a violent crew named the Rankers Posse. It was a crew of 50 men that grew up doing things in Jamaica that the average New Yorker only seen in movies. By 1984, the business was booming. He decided to perform a violent takeover of some New York neighborhoods the Dominicans and the Americans already controlled. This wasn't enough, so he ventured out of New York to places like Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore, and London, England. Early 1985, he was on his way to Philly but before he could hop on a train, he was arrested at Penn Station with a 9 double M. Since he was released, the next month he was caught up for slashing a man with a knife on Rogers Avenue in Brooklyn. In those days, the general public was in harm's way every time a posse of Jamaicans got together. One of those times was in New Jersey when thousands of Jamaicans were celebrating during a cookout when members of different gangs saw each other and unloaded. Multiple innocent people became victims, and three of them didn't make it. This was just another incident that brought the spotlight on what was going on on the East Coast. Delroy had an associate named Oswald who graduated from Harvard Law School. Oswald did a lot of things for the gang which included paying cash for a house for Delroy using Delroy's dirty money. Oswald hid the transaction through a company that he owned, and five years after the purchase, Oswald would pay a price for his involvement in these illegal activities. In 1986, Delroy would continue his terror throughout New York by taking over trap houses and blocks that belonged to other gangs. These gangs were also violent, so you could imagine what had to happen in order for Delroy to take over these city blocks. Delroy was a violent leader. He once gave an order for his men to go out and shoot anyone that looked like they were Jamaican. And in doing so, civilians and innocent bystanders were left paralyzed and with permanent injuries that they could never recover from. He wouldn't just impose his violence on other gangs. As that same year, three separate occasions he unloaded his firearm on three members of his own crew, hitting them in the legs to teach them a painful lesson of what happened if you steal money from the organization. His crew then ran down and tried to take out one of his competition at their trap house. Then two days later, beat another guy in the head with a weapon. 1987 would be no different as the violence continued. Because he was a leader, he took blame for the following crimes. Delroy had beef with a crew that had a trap house on Bergen Street in New York. So on a cold day in January, Delroy and his crew set the house on fire, and while it was burning, they unloaded, hitting a woman four times. She survived. 
A month later, they saw a rival dealer, so they chased after him and ran him down and unloaded. In March, they plotted on another enemy of the crew and ran up in his apartment on Chauncey Street and unloaded, making him another victim. Two days later, Delroy and his crew took a man named Norman to a basement where they repeatedly beat him with a baseball bat, hung him up by chains, and continued to torture that man. The next day, he was found wrapped in plastic on Pacific Street in Brooklyn. Three days later, they plotted on two other enemies sitting in a car on East 98th Street in Brooklyn. They ran up on them and unloaded. Five days after that, they ran down on two men on Saratoga Ave in Brooklyn and unloaded on both of them. That same day, they unloaded on another man while he was grocery shopping. A few days later, Delroy unloads his firearm hitting a man on a corner of Stone Avenue in Brooklyn. A few weeks passed by and Delroy ran up on another man in a subway station in Manhattan and unloaded. The next month, Delroy and his crew saw their enemies on Bedford Avenue in Brooklyn and they unloaded, hitting three men making all three of them victims. Four weeks later, Delroy unloads on a man by Rogers Avenue in Brooklyn. This was revenge for a beef and a violent event that took place in Philadelphia. Three weeks after that, Delroy and two of his soldiers went out of state and did two hits and made two more men victims of the war. Two months later, Delroy and his crew unloaded and made another man a victim. At the end of the year, Delroy and his crew did two more hits on Sterling's place in Brooklyn, making two other men victims of the war. In 1998, the violence continued and on March 9th, 40 police officers ran down on Delroy and his crew. And at 29 years old, he was arrested in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York. By that time, his empire had grew, and because he had locations in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Crown Heights, Brownsville, and other parts of New York, London, Washington, and Philadelphia, at his peak, Delroy's crew brought in more than $90,000 a day. In 1989, the Jamaican posses were running wild. The violence was out of control, and law enforcement continued to make arrests. They arrested his second and third in command, and from Philly to Washington, New York to Baltimore, 20 more members of his crew would be arrested and would later testify against him, sealing his fate. Since members and associates personally knew Delroy was guilty of the crimes he was charged with, they no longer felt fear and were confident that there would be no repercussions if they spent all of his money, and that's exactly what they did. By the time he went to court to fight the charges, he was represented by a public defender. While all the undercover operations were going on to stop the Jamaicans in America, the same was happening in Europe, specifically West London. London also had a drug problem, so they started an investigation on some small-time drug dealers. And during that investigation, they got suspicious of a building that had a lot of Jamaican activity and foot traffic back and forth. After further investigation, they discovered an operation led by two brothers, Leroy and Victor. The brothers were wanted of multiple crimes back in America, which included a couple of shootings in Harlem, where some of the victims survived and some of them didn't. The brothers were a part of Delroy's Rankers Posse, and they all were able to travel back and forth using fake passports with fake names that was provided by a guy who lived on Linden Boulevard in Brooklyn. His name was Kenneth, and he worked in the passport office. Kenneth would later be convicted of providing more than 20 passports to the Jamaican Posse's based out of New York. Now let's get back to the brothers. They had a smooth operation where they would hire women of the night to fly to New York and pick up packages which included cocaine and fly it back to London. After the investigation, the brothers were arrested in England and sent to prison. In 
They will serve time in England before being extradited and held responsible for other crimes they have committed in other countries. At the end, Delroy was convicted. He was found guilty of 42 charges, which included multiple bodies, 17 assaults and other heinous crimes. Because of the violence and all the innocent bystanders that was harmed during his leadership, Judge Deary said Delroy was a pioneer of the crack trade and no country deserves the risk of his ever being on the streets again. Delroy was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences plus 450 years in prison. At the time of this video, Delroy has no friends or family. Everyone he has known has passed away or abandoned him. The system has broken him and made him a lonely man as he's been behind bars since 1989. This was the cautionary tale of Delroy Uzi Edwards and the Rankers Posse. If you enjoyed this content, click on the next episode from Big City Crime TV.